Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at Fold Academy. We'll get this started in a bit so that folks who've registered have a few minutes to join the session. Feel free to introduce yourself um, in the chat if you haven't already. The chat will be closing when the workshop is underway. My name is Jonisha Lewinson, and I am the Interim Communications Coordinator at The Fold, um, the Festival of Literary Diversity. Um, you're currently tuning in to this session's um, first Fold Academy workshop called The Business of Publishing with J.L. Richardson. J.L. Richardson is, a, is the best-selling author of Gutter Child, which was shortlisted for the Amazon First Novel Award and was the recipient of a Word Award. Richardson lives in Brampton, Ontario, where she serves as the executive director for the Festival of Literary Diversity. If you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A box um, and they'll be answered at the end. And if you require captions, please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. All right. It's all for you, JL. <laughs> Thank you, Janisha. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, I am really excited, but also kind of nervous. Uh, whenever I do a new presentation or topic, I'm always like, oh, do I know what I'm saying? Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is the first, as Janisha mentioned, uh, Fold Academy of the season. So that's all so exciting. Um, if you haven't been a part of Fold Academy before, we do about six to eight of these over the course of the year. They're all free. When you register, you get a recording. And then um, at the end of the year, they're actually available on the Fold platform as well. Um, and then they disappear at the end of the summer. So if you uh, just keep that in mind as you're looking towards the rest of the year and the rest of the season. Um, so I just wanted to start for those of you who don't know me uh, with a little bit of an overview of my career and my publishing journey. And I'm also going to give you a chance to just briefly kind of lay out where you are in your journey. So I'm going to launch this poll, see if I can figure it out. Um, hopefully you can see that there. Uh, and then just walk you through where I've been, what I'm kind of doing. When it comes to the business of publishing and publishing one-on-one type sessions, you can go to 10 of them and learn so many different things at each one because every writer's journey is different. Every publishing professional's journey is different and all of our expertise are different. So um, my career looks a little like this. Uh, the Stone Thrower was my first book. It's a memoir, um, so nonfiction. And then I went and turned it into a children's book, The Stone Thrower. And then I published Gutter Child, which was my first novel. And then I published another children's book, uh, Because You Are, followed by The Hockey Jersey, which is my most recent book. The two books on the right are anthologies for which I've submitted and, and been included in, um, had articles uh, or essays, I guess. One's a short story and one's an essay. So I have a mixture of fiction and nonfiction. I have a mixture of um, uh, different like genre and styles. Um, so that's where my expertise is coming from. Um, and thank you, Eve, for introducing yourself in the chat. If you haven't done so, feel free to drop your name and where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, see, the large majority of you would describe yourself as emerging writers of some kind. And uh, there's kind of a, an ongoing um, uh, statement in the world where you're like always emerging, like even when you're established, you're emerging because you might be emerging into new genres, emerging into new kind of ways of navigating your publishing career. So um, nice to see so many folks who are identifying that way and excited about that part. Um, and those of you who are established, there's a few of you who have a few books or more. I also love to see you in these discussions because for me, I'm probably... I am in the more like established category as well, but I feel like there's so much I have left to learn. So many things I'm figuring out along the way. So I hope um, this um, discussion can be helpful to you. So I'm gonna end that poll there. Uh, I can share the results. So those of you who are uh, tuning in and I hope those of you who are watching the recording can also see those results. Um, okay. This is what I am going to cover over the course of this presentation. And this is how I tend to do these kinds of workshops. I go across the whole journey really fast. I'll spend a little bit of time at some of the areas that I'm more passionate about or that I feel a bit more knowledgeable about. And then I'll leave a decent amount of time at the end to go into questions because I think there's just so many things you could spend lots of time on. I'll be very honest about things I know a lot about and I'll be very honest about things I don't know a lot about or things that I only have my own personal writing experience on as well. And that way you can kind of navigate um, 
how much to believe me, no, <laughs> how much to accept what I say is law or something that you've got to figure out on your own. Okay. Before I do that, I have one more poll that I would like to try. Um, and that is a knowledge poll. And this is sort of like what you're looking to learn about. Um, I'm going to go through this journey, as I said, writing um, and editing and rewriting that whole process, submission prep and submissions, offers and acquisitions, editing and copy editing, marketing and publicity, release and pub date, the aftermath and the publishing parking lot, which is a only a term I use. Um, and so I'm curious what you might want to know a little bit more about. You can select all if you want to be, I should have just picked a select all option, but that might've been confusing too. So um, this is just really helpful for me to see how, um, where your kind of curiosities lie. Um, okay. So we're going to close the chat at this time um, and we'll, uh, you can put all your questions in the Q&A box starting now, um, but I will end this poll and show you the results. If you didn't get a chance to answer it, don't worry about it. Um, it's just a general thing. Okay. So lots of you interested in talking about getting an agent, submitting to publishers, promoting your book, advances in money, and just Canadian jobs publishing in general. And then there's the 7% that have something that I haven't listed there. Hopefully it gets covered. Okay. So I'm going to start with writing, rewriting and submissions, because for me, when I talk about the business of publishing, my passion is actually um, thinking about it on a money and time level. How can I make the most money or value my time? And so when I'm thinking about all of these things and the knowledge I'm giving, it's about how I can save you time and hopefully create opportunities for more money. So the first step in any sort of publishing journey is the writing, rewriting, and submissions process. You'll heard the term manuscript used a lot. They'll use the initials MSS. I did not know what that was at first. People would put it in emails and I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, no idea what it meant. Uh, so that's what that stands for. Writing and rewriting is the most important part in this whole process because it's the process of being a student. It's the process of figuring out your craft, who you are, what you want to write about, how you want to write it. And it's really, really important to get that right and to get that as right as possible. Um, when your uh, work is done or you have a sense that like I've gone as far as I can go with it, you'll also need what's called a query letter, which is a letter that will uh, um, go with your manuscript or a portion of your manuscript. When I submitted to my first editor, um, I had to submit only 20 pages. So it was the first 20 pages and then a query letter. And the query letter tells who you are, what your book is about, why it's important, and what sort of similar books might be out there. What is it like? Where does it fall on the genre spectrum? Um, and that sort of thing. The biggest advice I can give in this area is to look for opportunities, what I call their review opportunities. Look for opportunities for someone to give you advice from a professional perspective on your query letter and your manuscript. Those can be things like this, doing online webinars. It can be going to um, in-person workshops, if that's possible, or taking part in online classes, if that's possible. It can also be things like, uh, we have something called Pitch Perfect. And that at Fold, that's an opportunity. You pay $30 um, and you uh, get your first 20 pages reviewed by an editor or an agent. And these are very low risk experiences with high impact. So you submit to this agent or editor your first 20 pages, your query letter, even if it's terrible, they're going to look through it and they're going to give you advice. If it's pretty good or it's really good, they're going to give you advice. And that's going to help you actually submit it to a person with high stakes, right? Uh, afterwards. Sometimes from Pitch Perfect, people have gotten deep publishing deals, but I tell people like, don't look at it just for that. Look at it for your in progress as well. I think I'm almost done. I'm not sure how this is going and asking someone who is a professional to say, yeah, I think it needs another few rounds of edits, or I think it's pretty much there. You just need to strengthen this. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I would look for review opportunities. Um, one of the recommendations, I'll do this throughout the presentation, is I'll sort of point you in the direction of places where you can get more information. Um, so the the shit no one tells you about publishing, or is it about writing? I think it's about writing. I might have said publishing there. I can't even see. Um, 
about right. Oh, I did it right. Okay. Uh, that podcast is really, really helpful because they look at other people's query letters. So there's sort of two ways you can benefit from it. You can benefit from listening to other query letters and hearing other people's opening pages and the advice that's given. You can also have your work submitted for the potential of being reviewed on that podcast. So that's really helpful. You can also follow them on Instagram and always great writing advice. Sometimes I don't agree with it and I'll comment sometimes, but it's, it's that discussion, that thing thinking through the process. Another question people have a lot at this stage is, should I go to an agent or should I go to a publisher when I'm done my manuscript? Or for nonfiction, when I have this like very complete outline and query letter done? And I think it depends. <laughs> that's the answer. It depends. It depends on um, where you might see yourself. And that's why something like a Pitch Perfect is really helpful because, you um, it allows someone in the industry to give you advice. Um, my advice would change depending on the level of expertise of the writer, the topic of the work, et cetera. Um, the good thing, and I'll talk about this on the next slide, is that agents can help you through some really big, hard questions, but they're not the only route to your first publishing deal. Um, I, uh, my first book, The Stone Thrower, did not have an agent. Um, it was uh, a teacher had shared it with a friend who was in publishing, and um, they decided to take my book just from there. So my first publishing deal was entirely done on my own. My second publishing deal, Stone Thrower Children's Book, was the same, but I actually used that opportunity to land my first agent, my only agent. Um, so it, it, it depends. Um, and that'll kind of bring us to our next area of conversation, which is offers and acquisitions. So once your manuscript is done, once you have a query letter, once you're sending it out either to a publisher or an agent, the next thing you're looking for is an off offer or you're looking for it to be acquired by a publisher. And then in Canada, there are two main categories. Um, there are small presses and multinationals. Multinationals are the big three. You'll also heard them referred to in that way. Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, and HarperCollins Canada. And um, multinationals don't get any government funding. They, uh, and that's one of the big, they're also just the big ones. <laughs> um, small presses are Canadian independent presses. I love them. They come in various sizes from super small to quite large. Um, so uh, when you're submitting to small presses, they're actually more commonly working directly with authors, whereas multinationals are more commonly working with agents. So a lot of people with the glossy, like, I want to be a big name writer ideas will assume that you have to go to a multinational, therefore you have to have an agent. Not always true. Oh, there's also Harlequin is and Harper Collins are in there together. Um, it's not always true. Um, and so it's really important to look at what might be best for your manuscript. It's really great to look at other books that have come out, where they've come out and how they might be similar. Um, another thing that people are thinking a lot about are advances. Advances to me are glorified loans. And that's how I like to think about them. I try not to get too excited or too obsessed about them because they are to me glorified loans, uh, which means that they're going to give you money upfront. A publisher is going to offer you money upfront and you won't make any money on your book until your sales come across that same amount. So um, advances can be a little bit deceiving in that way, but where they are helpful is they tend to demonstrate um, either the breadth, the, the scope that that publisher, the amount of money that publisher might have, and also the, your potential for sales. So the other thing to know about advances is they come out in three chunks. So you will get a third right when you sign your offer, you'll get a third when you finish your manuscript, and you will get a third when your book is actually published. Depending on how your book process works, those could all happen very close together. That is not my story. <laughs> that is not my journey. I take a very long time to write books. So that first one comes, then the second one, then the third one. Um, on a tax level basis, if I could provide advice, I would encourage you to try to have them spread out into separate years. Uh, because if you do have a large sum of money in addition to what you make um, in another job, um, it can make your taxes very high. So you want to try and split that stuff up. Um, another thing that comes up often is multi-book deals. Uh, there are kind of two, well, there are many schools, I'm sure. But for me, there are kind of two schools of approach. Um, I don't do multi-book deals. Um, I was offered a multi-book deal after Gutter Child. 
Um, I was offered a second novel, uh, nonfiction, like all bundled together. And I said no, because I tend to work from a place of like inspiration, which sounds really corny, but um, I have worked on commission where someone said, write this, or I'd like to give you this project. And it was torture. It was torture. I didn't know what I was writing. I It took me forever to get the idea going. Even after it was going, I wasn't sure about it. It just put so much anxiety and a lack of enjoyment on the writing process that I just don't do it anymore. So um, the benefit of multi-book deals is if you're signing a deal and you already have, like maybe you had a book you wrote a long time ago that you've just sort of shelved, it can be great because you already have it ready to go and you just have to kind of polish it maybe. But if you're just ambitiously saying, yes, I'm going to write three more books for you, um, that can create a bit of stress because you don't know what life's going to do and and that kind of thing. So I would just say you don't have to accept a multi-book deal. You can say, no, thank you. I just like one. <laughs> just one. Um, the other thing I'll also say is offers along the line of offers and acquisitions and advances is to just be really true to what you're writing. A lot of us come with like uh, expectations about what a great writer looks like and sounds like. And we see, and I'll speak from personal experience. I used to look at lit fiction and be like, this is the best. I want to write like Heather O'Neill and I want to write like Miriam Taves and I want to, you know, I want to do all these things. And I just recognize like, that's just not what comes naturally to me. That's just not my style of writing. And so I always encourage people to really think about what your style and your voice is like what you're passionate about. If you're passionate about romance and thrillers, write romance and thrillers. Yes, you might not be nominated for those uh, big awards. I use Jane Igaharo as an example. She's a Brampton writer, um, a Black Canadian writer, and she has not been nominated for the Giller. Uh, that's not happened for her. But you know what? Every time I go in the airport, I see her books everywhere. So there are things that you get in different genres and with different styles of writing. And I'd say just be true and honest to what you're writing. If you're writing contemporary, write contemporary. If you're writing more literary, write more literary. But don't force yourself into a box that's just not meant for you. Someone to follow here, my agent, Carly Waters, does amazing posts about the different types of um, writing and the different titles that are used um, in in literature. Um, like I, there was one they used the other day, like high literature. I can't remember what it is. But if you follow her, you'll see all kinds of descriptions and explanations about the type of writing that you can do. Editing and copy editing. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this stage because it's not my expertise, but I just like to tell writers to be prepared for it. Um, once you get acquired, once you get an offer, once they give you your advance um, or your first third of the advance, at least you're going to be assigned an editor to work with. And that editor is going to take you through the next stage of your writing process. You may not have had any contact with this editor before, or you may have gone to that publisher with the sole like purpose of working with a specific editor. It happens in multiple ways depending on the publishing house. Mm -hmm. Some publishing houses are so small that there's like an acquisitions editor, per someone who acquires the work that is totally separate from the person who works on it. Other places you'll have someone that's both in acquisitions and actually editing. So it depends. But what they're going to do with you is these two or three stages are the ones I'm most familiar with. Macro editing. So they're going to take the book and they're going to go, okay, I know you said that your book is about this, but it's actually about this. And I want you to go through and edit it with that in mind. I want you to think about your character's arc. I want you to think about the minor character's arc as well. And I really want you to, you know, on a chapter level, kind of think about these themes and making this like more clear or strengthening this. So they're going to come up with concepts and idea level edits that um, you may be like, yes, that's exactly it. But you may also be like, oh, I didn't, I didn't think that was what it was about. And I just, just talk that through. <laughs> then they'll also do something called a micro edit. Well, they'll go through and they'll take that mean red pen and they will just like chop this paragraph, take this out. They'll circle sentences. They'll be like, what do you mean here? And it'll be a much more comprehensive detailed level edit from your editor. The last stage can often involve another person coming into your book. And that's a copy editor. And they will come and they will look at your book on the most granular level possible. They will look at every piece of punctuation to see if it lines up with grammar and punctuation rules. They will also um, look for uh, consistency. They'll look for accuracy. Um, they'll look for all these little things that you've probably forgotten about in the 
in my case, like seven years, it takes me to write a book. Um, and so it's a really comprehensive process, but it's also with someone who may almost or entirely be a stranger and who really is just markings on your Word document. And so that can be kind of um, a difficult process. I found it very difficult with the stone thrower. And when it came to gutter child, I said, I only want to know about grammatical errors that are causing problems in clarity. I don't want to defend every comma and every hyphen just because they would typically use a comma here and not a hyphen. If I've used a hyphen too many times, yes, but you know, like a, a, a looser, <laughs> a looser. There's also copy editing that can be, um, there's, there's a workshop we did a while back called decolonizing copy editing or in that vein. I can't remember if that was the title. Um, and it was about the fact that copy editing can be on this basis of like sort of English grammar rules. And so if you're from a marginalized community, if you're from a racialized community, if you're from the queer community or trans community, you might get edits back that reflect a lack of knowledge about the community that you're a part of, Indigenous communities as well. And so it's really, really important to be honest with your publisher and your editor before it goes into the copy editing stages about how that relationship might go and what you might need in terms of your personal um, um, safety. Yes, Eden, you're visible in your underwear in a workshop. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> that's my son, uh, marketing and publicity one. Okay. So this is one of the areas I'm most passionate about, and this is about how to take that business side of publishing and make it work for you. Um, and so one of the things I say, we talked about advances. And one of the things I say is to make advance, use your advances to make advances. So when you get money, whether it's $1,000 or $10,000 as an advance, think about the way you can use that money to create more money. So try not to, and this is a position of privilege for sure, but I, I want to put it out there. Try not to rely on your advances to live, at least in the initial stages. Try to make that kind of bonus money because you want to be able to use your advances to make advances. You want to be able to use that, for example, and the next point I make is to get professional headshots taken, to get your website started. You can also use it to make advances on your next book as well. So it doesn't just have to be for this book, but it's about making more room in your career. So it could be used to go on a writing retreat for this book or the next book, um, to take part in a writing conference, to travel to a festival you haven't been to before that might be really useful to you. So think about using your advances to make advances. Um, that's a really important concept, getting a new computer. Um, I'm trying to think of things that I did. <laughs> Hiring um, a, um, uh, an independent publicist. And that depends on if you're published in the States, for example, but your publisher's only in Canada. I've heard some people who get American publicists to help them make space in that on that side of the border. Um, prepare headshots, uh, get headshots taken and also prepare bios. Uh, I cannot express to you enough the importance of a professional headshot. I just, I cannot say how much it does to elevate your, the, your perception within the industry. Um, we've had authors come to fold who I've had authors who I've interviewed at events who do not have their professional headshots done. It is not a requirement, but it does. We, and I'll give an example. Sometimes we'll do like a highlights. Here are some of the authors that are appearing at the festival. And we will intentionally not use the ones that look like they were taken in your kitchen by your friend. Um, so because they just look, they just don't look as professional. And so they don't work as well in the promotional purposes. So get professional headshots, have a bio that's professional and have it in three different versions. Um, one to two sentences, three to five sentences, 10 sentences. You don't really need the 10 sentences, but some people just want to have it. Um, that's also like 50 words, 100 words, 200 words is kind of the parameters. Most publishing and most times when you're interviewed, you do not want the long one read. You want the medium or the short one read, no matter how ego driven you are. So have multiple bios, update them regularly. You might want to keep the old versions just for kicks. I looked at some of mine. They're terrible, but it's fine. Um, what I recommend now is look at other people's bios and just like 
insert your life into their format. You know, it doesn't have to be that serious. Sometimes there's sort of two areas where there's a struggle when you're first starting your career and you don't have much of a bio or when you've moved on in your career and you have too much stuff and now you have to start pulling stuff out. So um, those are hard areas and just look at what other people are doing. If you can see an evolution in someone's bio, look at how they did that and sort of copy it. If you look at my website, there's like a massive bio. And then when I do events, I shrink it down into much smaller versions. So you can look at what other people are doing to kind of um, create that. But you want to have those bios ready to go. The other thing is you need to be strong and competent and actively build a following with at least one of the following. These are, this is my opinion. Um, Instagram, TikTok, podcast, newsletter, blog. I would have said Twitter before, but I don't know about that anymore. Um, you can pick the one that best matches your personality. So here's here's a secret about me. I hate newsletters. I hate them so, so much. Pers it's just like a personal thing. I follow event newsletters and I follow a few of my city newsletters, but I just, I just don't love them as a source of information. I rely much more on social media content, which is also why that's, that's my area. I do not write a newsletter. I do not write a blog. It would take me all day and I, I don't enjoy it. So it's just not happening. So I chose the route of before Stone Thrower came out, I became an expert at Twitter. Before Gutter Child came out, I focused all my time on Instagram. I'm now trying TikTok. Don't love it, but I'm working on it. Um, I would love to one day have a podcast, just haven't been able to work that into my area of expertise. But it is really important that you build a following in one of these areas. If you're looking at expanding, continuing your writing, building a reach, this is really important. Something I didn't put in there is that you don't have to be an expert in your book to be an expert in something and to create sort of a niche and a following. So you might really like cooking and you might start doing like baking videos and baking tutorials, even though your book has nothing to do with baking, but you want to kind of build a following of people who like you and like what you do so that they're like, oh, I will follow you wherever you want to go. <laughs> um, and so I always joke, like post a picture, you, you like pets, you like your dog, Post pictures of your dog, post pictures with your kids, going to sports games or going to music or going to plays, and then mix in, um, as I'll show you in the next page, mix in stuff related to your book. Um, but you want to start actively like creating, cultivating a place where people can follow you. Marketing and publicity two. So creating content, as I sort of started to describe, is key. And you want to start this early. It is very hard once your book comes out to start also like creating things and building things. It feels very um, difficult. It feels, for me, it felt inauthentic. Um, so I tried to create a following and an interest in my life like before I went into my my book promotion because that felt a little bit more honest. Like, here's my family. This is what we do. I like taking selfies. <laughs> you know, here's my book. Uh, and so you want to sort of think about these things before your book's coming out. And oftentimes when I'm talking about marketing and publicity, I'm talking about that stage when your book has been submitted to your, the copy edits are done. You've given it to your publisher. You've gotten that second little bit of your advance. And now you're like in that awkward waiting stage. Your cover is probably done or almost done, but like there's nothing else happening. Um, this is a really, really important time to start creating, to create content. Um, you'll want to prepare for cover reveals. You want to prepare for your first like unboxing video. Your box of books comes in. You're going to either videotape it or take pictures. You want to create content. This is like the biggest part of what, even if it's a newsletter, blog, social media, the hardest part of these fields is creating content and having things to share and show. So start early, um, prepare um, some way of sharing events. I'm going to show examples on the next slide. Um, you want to prepare ways of sharing the blurbs and the quotes. So when your book comes out, you will ask a bunch of people shamelessly for a blurb. Will you read my book and say something nice about it? You'll put it out to them. Some will say yes, some will say no. Um, but eventually your publisher will have a few quotes to put on your book cover. Turn those into material and content that you can also share on your newsletter, in your blog, um, on your uh, social media platforms. Also prepare that after those blurbs, you're going to have friends, family, other people reading, and you want to also share what they've said about the book. Um, these are all really important things to do in this pre-book coming out stage. I had a bunch of templates, some of which I'll show you on the next slide, that I got ready and then I could use as the book was coming out.
Um, another thing I'm going to mention here and talk about closer to the end is start working on your next book. At this stage, when your book is with the publisher and all your dreams are about to come true, start working on your next book. Okay, I'll explain that. <laughs> all right, so these are some of the examples of things I created for Gutter Child. Um, things you should know about this this journey for me. When Stone Thrower came out, I thought it was going to do exceptionally well. I was told it was going to do exceptionally well. I was very excited about it. Stone Thrower is about my dad, who was a professional football player. And so I thought, oh, he's famous. This is going to be great. It did not go great. It did not sell very well. Um, part of that was my publisher went under as the book came out, but part of it just, it just didn't, nothing happened with it. And there was no like major marketing strategy for it. And so, um, it kind of went, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> and I was not prepared. I felt like I was like, this really, this isn't happening. Like something's going to happen soon. And so I just didn't have anything ready. When Gutter Child came out, it was in the pandemic. Everything was virtual. I knew that the only access I had was to create content and pump it out virtually. And so I put like all my mental marketing energy into this kind of portfolio of ideas. So you'll see in the bottom right corner, upcoming events, I would make um, little slides like that for each of the events, like each month, basically at the beginning of the month, I would post it. And then the day before the actual event, I would kind of share it in my stories. Um, you'll see the one top middle, that's a blurb from Cherie Dimaline. Um, So your blurbs may actually be quite long. And so I actually separated them out. So most of the people who blurbed my book, I actually had two different like statements that they made about the book. Um, top right is a quote from Farzana Doctor who didn't blurb the book, but who read it at a later point and then said that about the book. And then I turned that into like a, a review. Um, the picture bottom left is a picture I took when my books first arrived because I couldn't do an unboxing video because my books didn't come until after my book was out in the world. This was the pandemic and paper was like, Wah. and they were like, priority is getting it out to like schools and all the places who ordered it, not to the author. And so I didn't get it to like a month after I didn't get my box when you, when you, there's a magic day where a giant box comes to your front door and it's full with like 20 copies of your book that you can do whatever you want with. Um, and so I took this picture and I used it on my personal Facebook page as a way to sort of share with my friends um, that I had a book that was out. Um, and then top left, um, I was fortunate enough to be on the bestsellers list. And so I, I wanted to develop a sort of template I could use. I was on the bestsellers list for about um, eight weeks. And so I would use that template every time I was on the bestsellers list to kind of showcase uh, where it was sitting. Um, and then the bottom one is a picture uh, that a library took. So because of the way my book looks, uh, every St. Patrick's Day or every time someone does like a read a book with a green cover, um, God or Child gets pulled in often. And so I, I reshare those images. So this is all ways that you can make content for your um, social media. And you, you can use this for a newsletter as well, right? These are things that you could put in a newsletter as well. Um. Okay, release and pub day. So release and pub day is really exciting. You're like amped. Um, I've done an in-person one where I like planned it like it was a wedding. And then I've done a virtual one where there was going to be no wedding. It was just, just virtual. So I've seen from both sides. What I know about book launches is that a lot like weddings, it is one day and it's not the whole story. So don't overexert yourself in that uh, book launch, but do use it to create content. If you can get photographers to come out to your book launch and take a bunch of pictures, maybe it's a friend, maybe you exchange, like I'll edit your website if you'll come take pictures, um, use it as an opportunity to create lots of content, lots of pictures of you, you getting interviewed, you talking at a microphone, pictures of your book, you get a book cake, pictures, 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 people with your book. And you don't, you can release a bunch right after and sort of be like, look at my book launch, but you can also release those gradually over the course of your promotional cycle. Um, a phrase I call book cover blitz, put your cover out on your social media, on your newsletter more often than you think. <laughs> you should post, especially as your book is just coming out. I, I was trying to figure out what the math is. I feel like at least once a week, there should be a picture of your book on your Instagram, your Twitter, your social media accounts. Uh, and then as it stretches out, you might go bi-weekly, but like you really want to continue to put the book cover out there and put feedback about the book that people have loved. I know it feels annoying, but people 
forget. They are busy. They need to see it three, four, five times before they buy it. And then even still, they may not know where to buy it. And so you got to put it out there again with a link. And so there's a lot of like visual work to do to promote your book. Um, you can repeat content. A uh, person to follow on this front is Farah Haran. Um, author. That's her uh, Instagram account. And what I love about Farah, she promotes her events. She promotes her books, but she also promotes other people's books. And this is a way that you can make your page more authentic. If you feel like you're just promoting yourself, which you shouldn't be doing, you should be actively engaging with other people's works. Like, Hey, uh, Sam is doing this thing over here. Look, look, look at our books together. You know, like you can be doing a lot to kind of, um, help other people as well as promote yourself. And so I think this is really, really, um, it's a really, really important philosophy to kind of think about how can I put my book cover out there as much as possible? All right, publishing parking lot. We are rounding the end. <laughs> this is a term I use to describe the waiting game. Once your book actually comes out, and part of the reason why all that marketing and creating content is so helpful is because your publisher is going to do or should be doing a fair bit of work to try and get you to festivals, to book clubs, interviews, radio, TV, whatever it is. There should be work being done in that area. But even though there's work being done in that area, that doesn't mean there will be output. So I know that my book was being put out there. And yet with Stone Thrower, I did not get any offers for literary events, et cetera. And so I think it's really important to know what's happening, but also be prepared for nothing to happen and to have these sort of strategies in place. So by the time your book comes out, you you should be hearing about festivals that you're appearing at or events you're doing, or you can assume that they may, that may not be happening, <laughs> that that just isn't happening. And so you'll want to sort of do some work on your own. I would say before your book comes out, you should have a conversation with your publicist and be like, what festivals have you pitched me to? Where am I going? How is the promotion going to be? And if you're not like satisfied by that answer, do your own work. Um, consider partnering with other authors, uh, trying to moderate events, getting involved. If I'm being quite honest, what I would do if I was going back again is I would get involved in the industry the year before my book came out. I would be volunteering at festivals and volunteering at events and making friends and relationships with people who work in places that might be of interest so that I'm I'm coming at it from a place of relationship when I actually need it as opposed to like, hey, hey, I'm, I'm a volunteer, but I'd also like to be at this festival right now. Um, festival planning happens six months to a year in advance of the actual festival. So if you're coming at it when your book is actually out for the first time, you're you're too late. Someone who's really good at this and talking about this um, and just talking about the journey of writing in, in, in general is Kern Carter. And so that's someone else I would recommend you follow. He's a real like student of the industry. I believe he published, self-published his first book, then published with a small press for a second and is now getting published by a multinational for his third. And he also like does other types of writing outside of his own journey and just has really, really good insight about this kind of business side and about how to get yourself out there. He is like infamous for saying, my friends buy all my books. Like as soon as they come out, he makes sure all of his friends have his books. So really great strategy wise. Um, here's a really hard truth, but something that's really important to understand. Within a few months of your book coming out, you've done all this work. It may have taken years. Um, within a few months of your book coming out, there is a new season of pitches happening. Your publisher, your publicist is starting to pitch the new season of books. There's fall, there's winter, spring, and there's summer. And once your season is over, and even as the season is coming to an end, they're pitching the next round of books. So if nothing's happened for you as your book is coming out and into that first month too, um, unless you win an award or something happens that brings the topic of your book back into the center stage, like that's all the promotion that's coming. And that may be none. So uh, like I said, Stone Thrower had like uh, a documentary that came out at the same time that there was a lot of publicity around the documentary. And so I was just there like, oh, this is going to be great. It's going to be for my book as well. And there was nothing for the book. Um, Got her child. I was very fortunate, had long legs. That's what they describe it when it goes longer than like a six month cycle. So at the end of the six months or, or probably early on, I got nominated for a few awards and then it just sort of continued. And that was like a... A, a, as more of a success story in that regard. 
but I've seen it happen with my children's books. I've saw it happen with stone thrower where it just dies and it's just done. Um, stone thrower children's book and uh, memoir did not earn back their advances. They came out in 2012 and 2016. They did not earn back their advances until 2020 when the black lives matter movement happened. And people started saying, I need black books. And my books were brought into conversation on a number of occasions. And that's how I actually like crossed over into um, having earned back my advance. And um, so that that is a hard truth to accept and it leads to hard questions. And so I want to finish kind of on a heavy note but with a positive spin um, in saying like, it leads to big questions. And I, this is why I said a few slides ago, start your next project as soon as you finish your previous one before the book comes out. I was at an event with a writer who um, was like, I'm just going to enjoy and like be ready for my next book to come out. And then I'm going to start my book. And because her book sales did not go as she expected, because it didn't get nominated for the kinds of things that she had expected, she was kind of like, I don't know what to write. Like, I don't, I don't know what the point is. I don't know how to do this. Whereas when you start your writing project before you know how your book's going to do, you have, I started Gutter Child as soon as I submitted Stone Thrower so that even when Stone Thrower kind of failed on, on one front, uh, I was like, oh, I got this other thing I'm really excited about. And there was something to just keep me going. So why do I want to keep writing is a really important question to ask yourself, but also that's why you start your book before you know how your previous book is going to do. Uh, a question to ask is, what is my end goal when it comes to writing? And this is a question you can ask at the beginning, at the middle, and the end. What will make me feel like a success as a writer? How are you measuring success? Nobody wants to talk about money, and nobody wants to talk about like what it means to be a successful writer or what kinds of expectations you have of yourself, but I guarantee you will feel it. If your expectation of success is getting nominated for the Giller, then when the long list comes out and you're not on it, you will be crushed, and you will be like, but why? But why did this happen? Is my book not good enough? And if you don't acknowledge that that's like your expectation is there, it'll hurt even more because you'll just be down and be like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. So just really think about what that looks like, what you think success is, and then what it actually is so that you can process some of the hurts, some of the disappointments that inevitably come. The last question is one I'm dealing with lately, which is how does my writing motivation line up or conflict with my other responsibilities or priorities? So as this becomes difficult, as you face the difficulties and realities of the publishing industry and the business, you'll look at like the time you spent writing that's away from your family or the time you spent writing that makes your job, you're not able to like advance in your job or you don't want to advance in your job because you just want to be writing. You really want to think about like, what are my writing goals? How can I get there? What are my obstacles? How, how do I want to prioritize things? So a big thing for me is my, has, my, my son is now in high school and I really want to be there for like everything he does in high school as much as possible. And so I'm thinking about like, what's the best way to time my book coming out, my next book coming out so that I don't miss out on this like very limited once in a lifetime experience with my son. Um, and I haven't come up with a solution yet. It's just a question. So these are questions that I, I encourage you to think about. Um, I am going to stop talking now, stop rambling at a rapid pace. And Janisha is going to come out and start to pull out those questions from the Q&A box. And so we will talk about that. Cool. Thanks. I'll just get right into the questions then. So the first question is, is it true um, that if you have submitted to a publisher and it hasn't been picked up, it's a mark against you um, when you're looking for an agent? If you've submitted to a publisher and it hasn't been picked up and then you submit to an agent that it's a mark against you. Yeah, there's a lot of these statements about like it's a mark against you or if you double submit, then people are going to hate you or there's going to there's a lot of like anxiety that's created around publishing. What I will say is a good book is a good book and a agent or a publisher is going to find it at some point. Um, is it a mark against you? This is what will happen. An agent will be like, <clears throat> have you submitted it anywhere? And you will say, yes, I submitted it here. And they'd said no. And then they'll be like, do you know why they said no? And there'll be a conversation about that. Maybe they said um, it needed stronger characters and you've worked on it for a year. And now you're going back to the agent. Then I don't think it works as a, as a mark against you because you found out from an agent and a publisher what the problem was. You've brought it to an agent fixed. And if they like the book enough, they're just going to pitch it to somebody else. 
Um, they might not pitch it to that publisher again, or they might go back and say, hey, you said it needed stronger characters. I think there's been a lot of improvement in this. Have a look. So I think it's only a mark against you if you haven't actually figured out why it was rejected and or if you um, if there's something major like but usually if it's a strong book, it may just be that it's not for that person. So I would never say that an agent is going to be like, no, because they said no, because if they really like it, they'll like it. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Janisha, you'll be my judge of if I've made sense. Have I made sense? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, cool. Stamp of approval. Cool. Okay. So next question is, um, are agents able to negotiate larger advances at a small press or is the advance similar for both agented and unaged and authors? Yes. So typically here's where I'm going to use my own experience. So when I, um, with stone throwers, both of them, the amounts that I was given were a set amount. They don't give more for certain books or less for other books. It's sort of like a standard, um, advance. So there's not a lot of negotiating that the agent could do. There was like, it was, it was just is what it is. And so that's often how it is. I've found with uh, independent presses they have, because there's, there's government funding involved as well. There's sort of like a standard set of advances. So that's where the, you don't need an agent as often with an independent press, because there's not a lot of wiggle room to be made. Um, whereas um, multinationals, they have like a wide range of things that they negotiate within an offer and within their advances. And so you might say, and, and this has happened to me, I said, I would be interested in a lower advance. Like I'm not as interested in the advance as I am about being um, at multiple festivals. This is a priority for me to be like out and be traveling. I came out in a pandemic. It didn't help. Uh, but <laughs> but at the, I was negotiating before this happened. And so what was came back in the second round um, of the offer was a little bit more money um, because they couldn't promise that I would be get invited to festivals and therefore would need travel. So they were giving me extra money so that I could cover my own travel, essentially. Like that's kind of how it was worked in. So with multinationals, you can have a little bit of wiggle room um, that you don't usually have with independent presses. Nice. Um, is there a reason why you did not include Facebook in your list of like social media to market on? Yes. To be honest, there is. Um, <laughs> here's what I'll say in the indigenous community in particular. So if you're an indigenous writer, I've, I have heard and I have seen that Facebook is a more common, um, space where people um, share events and like do promotional work. It has not typically been like a game changer for bit promotion of books in my experience, both with Fold and with my own work. Um, so in the communities that I'm a part of, it hasn't been. So I should have put it because it can be, but I just would keep that in mind. It doesn't tend to generate the same kind of like um, followings. It doesn't seem to move as fast. That, that's also why I didn't put Twitter there slash X because it's also declining in that same way. So you're not able to build a following, share, see traction in as great amounts as you used to be able to. So you can use it, but I honestly would consider those supplementary. Like I don't think I could live... At the time I could live on on Twitter pretty much. That was like really growing fast and doing a lot for me. Um, now I don't think I could live on Twitter alone. And so I, I definitely couldn't live on Facebook alone in terms of uh, marketing and promotion. So yeah, that's why, but there are asterisks and special circumstances for which I probably should have included at least one of those. Yeah. Um, will a Oh, sorry. I didn't read that right. <laughs> Will a first book with a poor performance hurt the chances of a second book? Well, a first book with a poor performance. First of all, I would not say, um, I would not call, call it poor performance. And I'm sure that's just wording. I just want to clarify, you did a first book and that is great. <laughs> that is great. That is a big deal. And poor performance, or I would say something like, a metric like low book sales, right? That's not poor performance. That's low book sales, which is a different way of seeing perhaps the same thing. Um, it doesn't necessarily hurt because I think there is an understanding that like um, there are all kinds of reasons why books don't sell, especially post pandemic. 
I don't know what we call this era, <laughs> but like there, there were all kinds of reasons why books did not sell well. And so I would not be, I, I don't think people look at that and be like, oh, that means that person's not a good writer. It could mean that there was not a good publicity or sales or marketing strategy. Um, on the flip side, strong sales do help. So I don't know if lower book sales hurt, like people say, oh, that's just like, they're not a good writer. I think it's more that it's like, hmm, let me see what they're writing next right? Like, let's see what the next thing is. Um, whereas high numbers do say like, yes, let's see what's next. Like, give it to me a little bit more enthusiasm because it shows that despite everything that happens in publishing and despite everything that was going on in the world, there was good book sales. So that's how I would kind of keep it in mind. I would not put so much like negative pressure on yourself for low book sales. I would see that as like, I know what went wrong and what I need to do differently. And I would include that kind of thing in a query letter. So like, I think that I, like when I do query letters now for whatever kind of agent right now, I'm, I'm working on a TV film agent. I will say I am a go-getter. I will go out and hustle and I will do X, Y, Z. And I include those kinds of things. I learned from my first book that fill in blanks. So it doesn't have to be a negative if you can show it to be a positive as well. Great. Um, how do you find slash connect with agents? Um, okay. This is a great question um, because it's one lots of people have, and there's a couple of different advice, pieces of advice I would get. I I really believe that if you're committed to being a writer and being in this industry, you have to be in this industry. I used to actually, and I mean that either on a professional and or personal level. So I used to work as a prof at a college and I would go from my prof college job to literary events in Toronto um, and wherever I could. Um, and that was really, really helpful to me. So helpful to me. And I saw it to be so helpful that I actually quit working in publishing to start the Festival of Literary Diversity. Yes, because I thought the festival was important, but also because I saw working at a literary festival as a better way for me to be like really in, really in the space, in the industry, learning about it constantly. So literary festivals book conferences, um, writing programs. Um, oftentimes in all the writing programs I've been in, they've brought in guest agents. Um, so there's all these like little, little windows where you can meet someone and that makes a significant difference in terms of like asking the questions you need to ask, having an email, a name, a company that you can go back to. Um, I've been to Surrey Writers Conference at least once I'm back this year, they have like a blue ribbon. They have all these different events where you can meet agents, sit down at a table with agents. So if you're out West, that's a great opportunity as well. And I mentioned pitch perfect for fold. Um, that's a really easy way to uh, be paired up with an agent and be able to talk with them like casually. Yeah. They hang out at these things. They go to them all the time. <laughs> like my agent, Leonika Valsius, she was one I meant to put on one of the slides, actually. Leonika Valsius is a, a Black Canadian agent, and she's one of few. <laughs> um, and she, like, they will be at these kinds of events and conferences because that's where they meet new writers. That's where they learn things about their own jobs. So those places. Yeah. Book Summit. Yeah. Those kinds. What are your thoughts on writing across lots of different genres slash ages, age ranges versus trying to build your audience in one specific genre versus age range? Mm. I'm going to answer one question before and then come back to this one. So I forgot to mention at Fold, we also have a round table, um, virtual round tables. So there's also an opportunity, no matter where you are in the world, we have like a table with agents and publishers where you can, you can meet people virtually in that space as well. Forgot about that. Um, so writing across multiple things versus writing in one age. I personally, um, I personally write across genre, which is obvious. Right? I've written nonfiction. I've written dystopia. I've written children's books. I think it's actually really helpful to me. 
Um, when I wrote Stone Thrower adult version, a teacher said, oh, I love this, but I'd love to be able to share it with my grade one, two students. And so I wrote the book there. And so that's how, you know, some parents have found me from reading the Stone Thrower and then have gone to re read adult Stone Thrower or Gutter Child. So I think when you write across different genre styles and age categories, you actually have a greater opportunity to, to meet readers and to meet a wider range of readers. Um, I think when you write in one genre, um, it can also be helpful and beneficial because you become an expert that becomes your thing. Far Haran, Jane Igaharo, they are like romance writers. And when uh, there recently someone asked me to speak on the radio about romance writing, and I was like, I, I cannot speak to this. I, I have Far went on the radio and she did the column. And that's like, that's what you get when you create a niche, right? You can really become an expert on fantasy, on et cetera. So um, there are benefits to both and it really just depends on what you wanna write. I would say, don't feel like you have to go into any area that you don't want to go in. Um, I recently wrote something in a genre, an age category that I'm like, never again. It's just never gonna happen again. <laughs> So I think just knowing myself and, and figuring that out project by project and sort of honing in, like, I think for me, I love dystopia, but I also think there may be like a romance or a thriller in me yet. You know, these are things that I look forward to trying. So um, just don't, don't put yourself in a box unless you want it to be your box. And even if you get in and you're a romance writer and you suddenly want to write a children's book, like do it hundred percent, do it. What I will say that I love about writing children's books and adult books is children's books take a long time to like go from beginning to end, but they have a much shorter um, time commitment from me. So I can do them in a year tops. I've done one in a month. Um, and that's because they're so short that I can just like obsess over those 500 to a thousand words for like a month, two, three, four, however much time I want to take. And then it's gone. It's done. Like, I don't have to look at it again. The copy edits, the edits, they're all done within that either, you know, this, the one was unusual. Usually it's about six months to a year. And then it's a year with the illustrator and then it's to design and then it's to print. So it's a nice way for me to like break up what's happening and to, to have another project, another advance, another, you know, thing mixed in. So I've, I like my journey. <laughs> um, okay. There's so many questions. So little time. <laughs> um, let's do, where did I see it? Oh, okay. What are your thoughts on self-publishing in comparison to traditional publishing? How does one decide um, which route to take with their mm. project? Okay, this is a great and very important one. So I'm glad we got this in. We'll probably go a little bit over an hour and you can dip out if you like and come back to the questions in the recording if you've got time commitments. Uh, but this one is a really, 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 really important one. Because much like, and I thought about talking about it formally, but I was like, oh my gosh, I'll just go off on this side tangent and then I don't know how I'll come back. Okay, so much like genre where we have very specific expectations about what's good and what's not good, around self-publishing and traditional publishing, there's the same kind of like um, snobbery. Um, so I think there are times and occasions for which self-publishing is a really great option. And there's times and occasions for which it can be like a more difficult way. If you are planning on publishing one book, you have this family story you've written, or you have this children's book that you've always wanted to write, and you just like, want it to exist. You're not worried about it being in 17 bookstores or bookstores across the country. You just want to own it and have it out in the world. Or you are doing keynote presentations all the time and you want a book that's like your story that goes with you to those keynote publishing events. I think those are really good examples of where self-publishing is a great option. Also, if you haven't had success navigating the traditional publishing route, that can be another place where like, just publish your stuff, get out there, do it. Here's where the challenge is and why I sort of like asterisk, asterisk, have nervousness about self-publishing. The It's very difficult to get into bookstores when you're self-published. It is almost impossible to get into most literary festivals. It's almost impossible to get into some conferences and events. So your, your marketing area of opportunity is much smaller and that's difficult. The other thing is when you are self-publishing, all the costs are in your hand. And if you want to do it well, you do need an editor and a copy editor 
and a book cover designer and a printer. And all of those things cost money. So you're, you're putting all of it on your shoulders and you don't have a lot of ways to make that money back. So you have to understand that money part of it. When you traditionally publish editor, copy editor, uh, book cover, book design, all those things are handled by your publisher. And so that's where my like self-published, not self-published, it really depends on what your ultimate goal is. A lot of people will also say, if I self-publish, can I then get it published eventually like down the road? No, typically once you've self-published, that's it. That's the code. That's the one opportunity you had to publish that book and it's over. <laughs> and if it didn't go well, it just didn't go well. There are some exceptions to the rule. And some of you will text me and say, but what about this person? What about this person? There are some exceptions, but they are rare and they are unlikely. So um, it's really, really important to think through those kinds of choices and I would just say there's like a plus minus scale. You want to sort of say like, what are the positives and what are the negatives? There are not all positives on the traditional publishing side. And this is something else I'll say, just because you traditionally publish does not mean they're helping you with promotion or they're doing a lot of those things well, or they're making a nice book cover. So you might have to ask some hard decisions depending on, um, on that. You know, most of the people I know who self-publish, they wanted full control over everything. They had a skill in one area and they wanted to do it all and they like hustle and bustle and they go and they work. And that's just not what I was willing to do. So that was my reasoning and my decision. So we're at one, but let's keep I'm it rolling. Keep we'll going. go for a few more rolling. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so what are your thoughts on the timing of publishing a book? Did you personally know when you wanted to be published and how did you come to this realization? I'm currently coming to a current project after a writing hiatus. So struggling a bit with motivation to wondering what your thoughts are, if any, on how to approach the whole publishing experience in light of these barriers. Hoping this question makes sense. Yeah, I think um, in terms of, I decided to publish because I wanted the story about my dad. I wanted people to know my dad's story. And I actually thought I was only going to write one book. I thought I was going to go and be a prof and like one book and that was it. Um, and then after I finished So and Thrower, I, the idea for Gutter Child came about and I was like, oh, I think, I think I may want to be a writer. <laughs> I think I may want to do this more often. Um, I think the motivation piece is a really tricky one I've had in both of my books and in this third one that I'm working on, um, like moments where I just like, I thought it was a terrible book and I really like did not know how to get going on it. I think my only advice is just like, keep at it. Even if you can only work on a paragraph or a page a day, just try and like keep going to the project and read a lot watch some documentaries, films, even TV shows to help generate some excitement about the subject matter and the topic. And I do think the motivation does come back. I think it's the hardest part is when it's moving slower than you expected. And then you start to think like, oh, this is taking too long. This is using up too much of my time. This isn't worth it. And that's the kind of mentality that's really damaging. I think if you're gonna write, you commit to writing no matter how long it takes, no matter how many obstacles you're facing, no matter how slow it's going, you just you just do it just do it I like that <laughs> um is it better to start with a publisher that reflects your ethnicity oh that's a good one um okay so um mm, first of all it would be very difficult to make that your standard and your rule if you said I'm only going to work with a pub unless you're white <laughs> um it'd be very difficult to guarantee that you can work with a publisher an agent that represents your ethnicity um <clears throat> my agent and my editor are both white women. Um, and every editor I've ever worked with has been white. Um, and so, except actually recently, the hockey jersey, I was able to create my own writing team. So my editor was not white. My whole team was uh, BIPOC. It was actually quite lovely. So I think it's a great criteria to have. It's great to ask for. It's great to hope for. But I don't think it's realistically an option for everybody. So I would say what you need to be aware of is what that might mean in terms of the types of conversations you have and the type of expertise that your editor and or agent can bring to the table for you. Um, I've shared this story before, and my editor and agents both know it, but Gutter Child came out in 2020, uh, January 2021. We were finishing it in the summer of 2020 when the Black Lives Matter movement was happening. And I decided to change the ending based on what was happening in the world. And um, 
it became very obvious to me that neither of them could really help me make that decision that because of what was happening and who it was affecting that there just there just wasn't the understanding that i would have needed to say like what about this and what about this um i just had to kind of decide do it and like just i had a few black friends who had read the book that i went back to and was like what if i cut this what if i do this and they were like yes you know and that was the kind of reaction i needed whereas my editor was like i don't know i don't know so it, there are moments where when you are from a marginalized community and you're working with editors, copy editors who are not from those communities where you will notice those gaps and where you'll have to make decisions that just like line up with your instincts. But I think it's very hard in Canadian publishing to say like, I'd like to work with black folks all the way through. Um, and I had this talk with Lawrence Hill as well. I think Larry, last time I spoke to him said he had never worked with a editor of color in his life and and like he's had a long career and he recognized it as an absence as well so it's an unfortunate thing but um I think knowing it and being aware of it is better than just thinking it's going to be okay are we good to keep going yeah we can do a few more okay <laughs> um when you have an agent are they with you till they drop you or vice versa or do you have to pitch every book separately Mm. No, your agent is with you for the long haul. Um, typically, typically you sign up with someone and they're there for the whole journey. Um, there are times in which the relationship doesn't work. So you will like, uh, I'm going to move on and they might say, I'm going to move on, or I'm going to pass you on to a different agent at my space. There have been times in Canadian publishing recently where agents have changed jobs They've gone from being agents to being, you know, editors or publishers. And that means their whole client base is like I is up in the air. They can either go with the person that's like replacing them, or all those authors can sort of say, I want to use this as an opportunity to find an agent that's that's suited to where I'm at. So um <clears throat> My agent, when I found Carly, I was, I got rejected by a few agents and then she said yes. And in talking to her, we just had so much in common. Um, we had both been like varsity soccer players. It was like weird things that we had in common. And and she was from the suburbs of Toronto as well. And so we've just had like a really good relationship ever since. And um, so, yeah, I've, and, and I was thinking about this the other day too. It's a good thing to think about in terms of your age too, because at some point your agent's going to want to retire or going to want to move on with their life potentially. And so that's another thing to just be open about and, and talk about, because if you're with someone um, you want to know, like you would just want to be prepared. I don't think you have to like jump ship in advance, but they, they will negotiate every contract for you and help you with everything. So long as you're paired together. You mentioned uh, standards. Uh, mm. You mentioned standards advance given by standard advances. Sorry, given by Canadian independent publishers. Could you share approximate numbers for like fiction, poetry, nonfiction? Yes, I don't have um, poetry for sure. Um, advances can be low as like a thousand dollars, and I can share. My first one was about six thousand, I think, and that was like. 2012. So it was 6,000 and I got it in those three chunks. That was with an independent publisher. My children's book with an independent publisher was 12,000, but it's divided between the writer and the illustrator. So it ended up being 6,000 as well. And they were kind of what they call boilerplate contracts. So it was like the contract is just set and they just put the author's name in the top. So that was standards back in 2012 and 2016. Um, larger presses I don't know. I can only speak for myself. They can be six K six figures. I've never had a six figure deal ever. I see them in like announcements for publishers. I'm like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> um, um, but I have been fortunate enough that like gutter child, um, did burn back its advance. So I think I got, I think that one was like 30 K and it, I ended up earning it back. So that was really nice. Well, oops. Do you have any um, thoughts on pros and cons of publishing with U.S. publishers versus Canadian publishers mm -hmm. as a Canadian writer? Yes. So uh, a weak point of mine, I, I not a weak point, but just like a expertise that I don't have is I've never been published by U.S. I don't have any international book deals. I've been, you cannot get my books unless you go through like the Amazon type channels in any other country in the world. Um, a lot of good money is made when you get international deals. That's where you can get like big, like uh, 
bulk amounts, I've heard. <laughs> um, okay, so what do I know about the states? In the states, you're working with larger advances. So that's a fact. Uh, if you're getting book deals in the states, usually, especially with the bigger houses, there are larger advances because advances are based on sales and there's more bodies, therefore more sales. So those six big figure advances usually are US deals. Usually, I, I do know Canadians who've had six figure deals. Um, six figure, de figure deals in Canada are stressful though, because you're banking on like a small population, like being very aware and committed to buying your book. So, um, advantages are just, yeah, that bigger market, that bigger amount. Disadvantages are there can be a disconnect between what's happening in Canada versus what they're doing there. Um, there can be, we've had, for example, at Fold, Canadian authors who are only published in the U.S. and the U.S. didn't know about Fold, and so they didn't pitch them to Fold, or they didn't pitch us at the right time. Um, and so there can be a disconnect between like what you feel is very clear and aware of what's happening in Canada versus what they're dealing with in the States. Um, yeah, and then the, the I was talking to an author who got sent on a U.S. tour, and the U.S. tour was super random. It was like boondock mississippi like you know you know phoenix arizona like there was just all over the place it wasn't like what you might think it would be and it was like far travel just one night it was a little bit of stress doing that so it, it's different yeah all right looking through the questions um what happens when your book doesn't make back the advance uh, amount in sales Nothing. <laughs> you just feel guilt and shame for the rest of your life. <laughs> no, I mean, that's true. Actually, everything I said was basically true. Uh, so like nobody comes and says you owe this amount. Um, what I have heard, what I have heard is that they set advances based on what they think is like very safe parameters on where they won't lose money. So um when you don't earn it back, it's not like the company is going under because of you. Like they've already anticipated that possibility, but it does affect potentially what your next advance might be. And it does affect, honestly, what I've seen most with, with my friends and even with myself, it affects your confidence and your confidence in negotiating and your confidence in like, should I do this? And how am I doing? And all these sorts of things. So it's really like a lot of pressure to carry around. It's very exciting, but a lot of pressure. So that's why I am very big on coming up with my own marketing strategies, my own marketing plans, because I like to be able to say at the end of the day, like I did my best. I did my best. Um, but yeah, nobody chases you down. It's not like actual, that's why people say it's not a debt. It's not loan. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it is hard. It is hard, especially if you had a larger advance and you feel like you, you, it, there's a feeling that you've disappointed people. You've disappointed your editor. You've disappointed your publisher. You've disappointed your publicist. Um, I don't know a single, especially the, the writers I know that I've spoken with about this matter. It, it, it does, it does hurt. Um, and so that's why, uh, but there's no like legal implications for it. You suggest applying for Canadian artist grants. Is there one you'd suggest for someone who is new to writing and publishing? Oh, yes, but I don't remember what it's called. There's a couple of different ones. There's some that are like by publisher. So the publishers can actually recommend you. There's like the artist rec ref. Mm, I can't, the artist recommender grant. I can't remember something along those lines. Um, and then there are like for the Ontario Arts Council, there are writing grants. The thing with the grants is they're very competitive. They're very difficult to get. So it's very hard to like bank on them. Much like with your manuscript, you want to get better and better at your manuscript and writing your grants. So it can be like a bit of a divider of your time. But I think if you sort of strategize it out, I know a number of writers who will sort of say, if I get this grant, then I will do X. And if they get it, they do it. And if they don't, they don't. Um, and then they'll kind of repeat that. So um they're a hard thing to bank on, but I would definitely look at your provincial granting bodies and your Canadian granting bodies under the category of publishing and writing and see what's possible there. And when you have questions about individual grants, there's usually like a granting officer that will answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any advice for making those connections in um, 
the industry if we don't live near a big city. Yes. So if you don't live in a big city, which I find is a lot of people who do these webinars, honestly, it's how I started with them, um, is virtual events and virtual programs and courses. There's a lot, a lot of them. Um, a lot of universities that offer like one-off courses that you can do. Uh, Fold has an entire virtual program and a virtual slate of offerings. That is, you can meet agents, you can meet editors, you can talk with people in between events. Um, and I highly recommend that. I, and I think we'll probably wrap up here. I think it is critical to be involved wherever possible. And if you're not in a city center, I think it's about finding virtual opportunities to connect with other writers. You can start a writing group in your library, but it is really helpful to have some kind of accountability when you're working on a book because it's such a difficult and draining mental process. So it's really helpful to come into these spaces and hear from established writers that like it's hard <laughs> and it's always hard. It takes me five years to write a book minimum. And it's really helpful to hear that from people because it reminds you like, I can take 10 years. I can take 15 years if I need to, to write this book, 20 years if I need to, I just need to keep at it. And the further away you get from these types of conversations, the more depressed, the more like uh, down on yourself you can get. So finding ways virtually to connect reminds you that like you're not alone in it. And that's a really important part of the process. So thank you everyone for your great questions. I hope I helped at least a little bit. Um, the recordings will be sent to you. I'll pass it off to Janisha on that front, but um, uh, I look forward to, I'll finish actually by putting my screen up. It has my website and my um, social channels if you wanna check me out there. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, JL, for your time and your wisdom. And thank you to everyone who has attended. Um, just a heads up, Full Kids Book Fest is coming up um, November 1st to 5th. You can join us virtually November uh, 1st to 3rd with our virtual passes. If you're an educator, there are special events for students K to grade 10. Follow us at Fold Kids or check out the foldcanada.org for more details. This, uh, the recording, as Shayla said, will be emailed to you within the week. Have a great rest of your day and weekend.